It's very sad to see a child of 13 years old uh, maybe going to destruction. And some of them, they don't even have other dreams than being on the streets. One of the girls said, my dream is to learn to write my name. I can only write the first letters. That's not a real dream. That's not what God planned. God has much bigger dreams, but they don't know. All over the world, big cities have big city problems. They attract many poor people who hope to find a future for themselves and their families, but many of them will never find it. The third largest city in Brazil is Belo Horizonte. It has four to five million inhabitants, from very rich to very poor. Slum after slum emerges on the hillsides surrounding the city. Thousands of slum children, some with their mothers, live on the streets. Around 400 of them live there permanently. The slums and the streets have similar problems. Alcoholism, drug abuse, violence, sexual abuse, illnesses. Many suffer, many die very young. A couple from Holland, Johan and Jeanette Lukasa, a school teacher and a nurse, obeyed God and came to help these children some 20 years ago. They have five children, most of whom were born and raised in Brazil. Johan and Jeanette work with Jocum, Portuguese for Youth with a Mission. Now there's a multi-layer project which has reached thousands of street children and their families. But how did it all start? When we started out working with these street kids, we had a small team of about five, six people, and we would go to the streets. We wanted to get to know, why are these kids on the street? What kind, of, what kind of kids are they? What's their problems? And so we would just take our sack lunch with us and sit in the park, and you know, we're there at 12 o'clock, we eat there, and the kids are there. And you say, oh, you're hungry as well? We always, of course, took some extra bread with us. Yeah, yeah, yeah uncle, I'm, I'm hungry as well. Yeah, okay, and you share, you share a piece of bread with them, you share your meal with them. It's just such a powerful thing. They would use a lot of slang and, and all of a sudden would start fighting or some of them would be really high on drugs. And so in the beginning I, I was a little bit afraid, didn't know too well what was happening, what they were saying. And But at the same time, I, the Lord gave me a lot of love for them and, and seeing kids who were on the street, young kids. and, and knowing they were sleeping there. They didn't go back home. They didn't have a mother who would cook their food and, and take care of them. You could see a lot of, of loneliness in those kids. The juvenile judge of Belo Horizonte, Dr. Costa, analyzes part of the problem. A major problem is the school system here. Children only have school for half days either the morning or the afternoon. If both parents work, the rest of the day they are left to themselves. And many children come from families with lots of problems, so they have reasons plus the opportunity to spend much time on the streets. When they do, they are approached by drug dealers, start using drugs themselves, and become criminals. Many girls get pregnant. Finally, they quit school, leave home, and stay on the streets. I believe that much of this problem could be solved if children could go to school mornings and afternoons. They would be more involved in sports, they could have extra classes, but at least they would stay off the streets. The problem is that offering all children full-time schooling would cost a double amount of money, which our Ministry of Education does not have. Teams of Jokum go visit the kids on the streets. Their first goal is to win their trust and motivate them to want a better life. That's not easy. Their brains are usually clouded from sniffing glue, and they're unable to accept any rules or discipline. Wanda is 17 years old and a mother of a two-year-old child. How long have you been on the streets? 
I don't know, but it has been quite a long time already. Why did you start living on the streets? I think I was family. Uh, I had problems with my family and uh, ran away from home. Would you like to get off the street? Yes, but I don't have a house to live in. And my child lives with my mother now. I need to have money for food. What kind of future do you see for yourself? I would like to have a job, like cleaning. Would you like to go to school? No, not really. I can read and write a little bit. The kids started on the streets, kept on asking us, well, can we please come in and live with you? And we would go and visit their families, very often with them, would take them and said, well, show me where you live and where your mother lives. We would go and, and visit those little houses and sometimes we could put them back into their families. And we also visited families of kids that we really saw, well, those kids cannot go back to their own mom, to their own little home. Mom is always drunk, there is no father, the older brother is dealing drugs inside the home and, and all kinds of things going on. And so that's when we saw, well, we, we really need a home for those kids who cannot go back. Some children are first sent to the streets by their parents to earn some money. They sell little goods to help the family survive. But soon enough drug dealers show the child how much easier and lucrative it is to sell drugs and rob people. They get accepted by the street children and stay with them. But violence and disease are in the same package. Wesley is 15 and from a poor Christian family. Sick and tired of street life, he came to the rescue house. My name is Wesley LaCruz. I love my mother and I have to help my family at home. But now I live on the streets. That's my home. But life on the streets kills you. I want to lead another kind of life and I'm looking for a job. How do you earn a living? By begging and robbing. Do you sniff glue? Uh, I like to smoke soft drugs and I sniff thinner. Uh, but not crack. Okay, now that you're here, I'll give it a chance. What will you be doing here in the House of Rescue? I don't know. I'll see when I'm inside. Every time children come to the House of Rescue, they can freshen up have a free shower, and usually a hot meal. Some children seize the opportunity to wash their clothes or receive new second-hand outfits. Staff spend time with them, like Mia, a Finnish volunteer. Well, when I look at them, I see a huge need of love and acceptance, and so that they would really realize that they have value, a great value. And my dream is that they really come to find that value in God and see their lives change. Some children really want to change, but fail to do so. Their dreams and good intentions are not enough, like Wilson experiences. Wilson, what would you like to do with your life? Why? Well, I love soccer, and I would love to become a famous soccer player. Do you really want to get off the streets? Uh, yeah, and I'll try to live with God, and I'm sure that someday I'll make it. God help me. If you're sure of that, what keeps you from living with God today? His answer when I asked him, what's really the barrier of not living with God today? He's saying, well, it's drugs that keep me away from God. And I think that was a very honest answer he was given there. The number of street children you, you find on the streets in Belo Horizonte is, is not a huge amount. The kids who actually stay on the street and live on the street on a long-term basis are probably not more than like 400 at one time. During one year we had like 2,000 kids in one year making their entrance in the rescue house and they were all street kids, but they were never there at one time. Passado 2001, 
Nós tivemos... Last year, only here in Belo Horizonte, we have had around 7,000 cases in which a child was caught in the act of stealing. For these children, it is their way to survive, but for our society, it is really a problem. Our greatest concern is the spread of drugs. The use and traffic of drugs infects all layers of society. It is like an uncontrollable disease, and we do not yet have the right means and strategy to deal with it. If a street child stays on the street, there is a, a statistic that says 30 to 35 percent of the kids on the streets will die before they are 18 years old. The, the, these kids are involved in, in drug trafficking often. Now, if they don't pay their bills, they get killed. Uh, overdoses in drugs and, and all kinds of medicines they take. And they may get AIDS. Uh, I know of a kid who just got his, his throat sliced. He was completely drunk and another gang leader just came around and he had something against him and just slit his throat, died. The problem of street kids in Brazil is grave. Although we do not have millions of them like many people in other countries tend to think, still they represent serious social problems. In Brazil we have both Switzerland, the rich, and also Botswana and Afghanistan, the poor. This causes huge social differences. Sadly enough, our welfare program is insufficient to really help the poor. They need more and special help to be able to restructure their families. Poverty, lack of a safe family structure, and violence all around make slum children cut the ties with home and leave. Of course, in all social classes, it happens that children run away. But in my function as a juvenile judge, unfortunately, I see mostly children from the slums. The street team works hard to build trust and motivation within them. Children who are motivated enough to start a new life are offered a free two-week program in the House of Rescue. We normally accept five kids at the same time. So get off the street, we mark a day with them. Well, okay, Monday, all five of you can come to a House of Rescue for two weeks. And so during those two weeks, they have to learn to live in a house again with, with the walls around them, with people who say, well, we are going to sleep now and it's time to sleep and there are hours for, for to have breakfast and lunch and supper and, and all those little things they, they were not used to anymore. It's very hard for them. Often it's even so they are so disturbed that sometimes at night even they'll wake up and they want to run away or you know they, they go like crazy sometimes they may have demons or something like that you know and, and so the team is, has done a very intensive time of play games with them, sing with them, pray with them, do Bible study with them, cast out the demons or whatever is needed, take them on an outing and do something but they're busy all the time. Most of those kids have for example, gone to uh, spiritist centers if they needed money, and they would literally sell their soul, say, well, I will, I will give my life and my soul to this and this spirit, and they would get money back for it, like 10, 10 bucks or something like that. And so you have all those demonic influences in those kids. So you have to pray and, and set them free. That's all normally comes up during those first two very intense weeks. They have to learn that, that Jesus died for them and to set them free and, and to give them hope. Boys that successfully complete these two weeks are offered a place in the House of Restoration. It is an old school building Joachim was able to purchase after Johan and Jeanette ran out of space in their own home. Now they are able to permanently house 30 boys who cannot return to their own families. Alessandre with his wife, Florinda, from Malaysia, are responsible for them. I came not knowing much about working with street children. And my first day here, I cried. I locked myself in the bathroom and I just cried because I just didn't know what to do. I thought, oh God. Why did you come here, you know? My life story is so different. I can't say I understand what they went through. You, you hear stories, you watch films, 
but you never think that you're actually going to be there with someone who tells you, oh, I've been abused by my mom or my dad, or my dad beat me like that, or my mom raped me, and you think, this is so unreal, this is not, and you think, wow, he's only 10 years old, things like that shouldn't happen, it didn't happen to me. The basic thing of the work here, of showing them that they are loved, that even though all those things happen, even though it was never meant for them to happen, all those things, that they are special, that they were created for a reason, because a lot of them have been told that they were born out of mistake, out of, you know, something. So they always have this rejection. No one wants me, no one loves me, no one accepts me. So by being here and loving them and accepting them, you know, I think it brings a lot of healing. And so they need more than an ordinary child would need in attention, in dedication. And sometimes you can work with a child for many years and he still um, doesn't want to accept um, the healing that God has to offer him. Or he doesn't want to trust that love that you are giving to him. And some of them leave and they die and they pass away. And you think, God, what am I actually doing here? Um, is it worth what I'm doing? So it's hard. It, it's, it's very typical. Those kids here in the, rest, in the restoration house, some of those tough, tough, tough kids, you know. And they're doing okay. They come in here as long as they are, as long as they feel they're in control of the situation. They, they stay. But as soon as they see that they have to obey, and as soon as they start to bond with somebody and they start opening up their hearts and talk a little bit about the hurts of the past, how their father didn't care for them or, or whatever happened there, and they open up and they may cry and, and, and the staff worker may put their arms around them and say, hey man, let's, oh, I'll pray for you, I'll help you, I'm here. And then suddenly he gets so scared that somebody's coming so close and that he's going to be rejected again. Often when, when these kids have a breakthrough emotionally, next day they split and run. It's just so typical. Some kids run away, come back, and take their second chance. Like Anderson, he lived on the streets for three years. Same story, you know, abuse, physically abused by his mom and his stepfather and his father. His parents were separated for a while, and so he got involved in bad company and started using glue and was really addicted to glue. And the street team took him, his gachi, brought him over here. Uh, he was a very sick boy, and he would try to run away many times. He would run away to go back and sniff glue, and then he would come back at night and say, please forgive me, take me in, I don't want to do this. But it was a very hard struggle. But now, today, he's a f very happy, 15-year-old, he's going to be 15 this year, uh, boy, you know, he is very full of God, you know, he prays and reads the Bible every day, he has such a love for God, when he worships God, you can see that joy he has from God, you could not imagine the difference of the boy that came in, and the boy that is... Sports is just so important, especially kids who come from the streets, who have a, a drug background and who, who, who don't really know how to spend their time and how to, how to really go around with aggression. And so they, in, on a, in a very natural way, they, they get rid of their aggression and just, ah, you know, we just had a good game. And that's it. And it's also good for their character because they have to make the right choices right there at the, at the court. So I'm, I'm always challenging them with that, with their attitudes. So it's become quite a, quite a job, so I'm coaching, fixing their stuff, and uh, when they can't fix it, I fix it myself. Because the equipment is quite expensive to have uh, skates and, and the helmets and the whole thing. It's quite expensive, and so they, these kids are ex-street kids, and they now play with teams. We are often kids from a very you know, wealthy families, or at least you know, a little better off. It's really good for them. And for the relationships as well, to play in a team is very, very good for them. What also helps the boys is maintaining a disciplined daily routine. 
boys that go to school in the morning, they start their day around 6 o'clock. They get up, they have their breakfast, they have their shower, some eating, and then they prepare and they go to school. And then they come back around lunchtime. Um, they have their lunch, they have people that help them with their homework. Each boy has a work duty like cleaning after lunch, cleaning the tables or something. And then they have sports. Uh, we have two boys who just finished a, a computer course. Some boys do courses. Others have started their first full-time job. One of the boys with a criminal and violent past has come a very long way. He's a professional hairstylist now. So, the children learn to live normal lives, and some do really well. But is that enough? It's very difficult for a kid to leave permanently the streets, the drugs and everything, if he does not have an encounter with God. It's very difficult. We really want to teach those kids that they themselves can, can have a relationship with God as their father. Because we are not always there for them. But God is. It's also the only way you can really work through that hurts to show, you know, your father and your mother may have abandoned you, but the Lord will never abandon you. And so we, we have to teach them for, for the rest of their life, they can, they can hold on to God. And that's, that's how they should live, and, and that's where their new life is. Usually, his relationship with one of the workers and the friendship is the first starting point. But then soon comes, hey, why I'm doing this is because I love God. And I have a relationship. He's my father. I have a relationship with God. Wouldn't you like to have a relationship with God like I have? And these kids go like, that is possible? I've, 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 I've had kids tell me when I would tell them, wouldn't you like to be a man of God like I am? Wouldn't you like to have a relationship with God like I have? And it could turn to me and say, Johan, that is impossible. I've already killed somebody. I can't do that. God will never accept me. And that is just such a tragic moment. And it happens. And then for you to be able to say, hey, but God can forgive you. And God can change your life. Ah. And then these kids, their eyes is light. And then they say, hey, is that possible? It's just, you know, and that's just, that is, these are just some of the moments that, that, that will really uh, make an impact on them. Uh, and so that's powerful. The powers of darkness, however, do not like to let go of these kids. It's, it's one of the, the most terrible songs I've ever heard, I think. He was saying, like, the, the Lord is my shepherd and uh, I, I have everything I need. And then he started saying, well, everything I need is, is drugs, is sex. Is, is and then at the end he said, well, and, and this Lord is Satan. And it was, it was just a little kid. And to know that really his life belongs to, to Satan. Spiritism is, is very much a way of life in Brazil. People are very religious. If you ask Brazilians on the streets, you believe in God, you believe in, in, in the spiritual world, everybody will say, I believe in God and spirits are real. There are statistics that say something like this, 60% of Brazilians are Catholic and 60% are spiritists. A lot of children, when they are small, are being dedicated by their parents to, to certain spirits, certain demons, and that happens a lot. And so they carry that whole weight on their soul and on their spirit and on their lives for a long, long time. Although 50% of the children in the Yokum project run away once or more, still over 80% in total succeed in the end. Davidson is a comeback kid who needed special treatment after his return to the House of Restoration. When he was accepted back here, we had some very difficult days with him when he was totally demon-possessed. At some point, he really started to scream and say things that were obviously, obviously not his, him, his own voice, you know, and the team prayed with him and in the name of Jesus, and he was able to be set free, and so he's, he's, he's coming alive now. <laughs> That's wonderful to see. You can see the difference in his life, in his eyes. And the day that we went to visit his mother, how he, 
went around to getting some toys for a, a little car and a drum and, and the the love and the, the pride you would see in his in his eyes giving it to his brother and, and the care you also could see that he had for his mother and for his little brother. It's it changed, yeah. We also visited the family of Joyce. 12 years old and the youngest of seven children. Her mother is mentally retarded. Joyce was often beaten up by her family. The government placed her in the mental hospital with her mother when she was six. She stayed there for three years. Then she came back, she, she ran away, she came back to this place and she was raped three times before she came to our house. And her sisters were very afraid that she one day would be murdered. So they said, please take her in, we can take care of her. Joyce was admitted to the girls' house of the Jocum project, Recanto House, which is Portuguese for something like cozy corner. Here she has begun the long process of healing and restoration. Joyce is the youngest of the 12 ex-street girls living in Recanto. They have fun, they seem to be happy. It's hard to believe that each of these girls has a past very different from the average American teenager. Each of these girls has her own story of brokenness. The leader of the girls' house is Wilma from Brazil. With a few staff members and volunteers, she helps these children and young women recover from their past and build up their future on dreams and reality. These girls all struggle with behavioral, sexual, and psychological problems. We counsel them. We find many of their problems are caused by sexual abuse in the past. This happened to 99% of them. Many have been raped as well. They feel dirty discredited and marginalized. Some have lost the will to live and became passively suicidal. Others have built a fantasy world, which they hide in when reality gets too tough. We now have a group of girls who have suffered a lot, who know what suffering is. Here they have discovered they are valuable. This makes them fight for a better life. Fabienne is 15 years old. She became a drug courier for the big boys. Thank God I was never raped. My parents lived in a constant fight. My father was an alcoholic. I left school in seventh grade and went to the streets. I began drinking so I wouldn't be afraid at night and I sniffed thinner too. In the morning I went home to clean a bit and sleep, but went out again before my mother came home. I began delivering drugs for dealers in our slum. When I made a mistake, they beat me. They show no mercy. I really went downhill. I felt a lot of darkness. I did call on the devil on one particular occasion. I needed five dollars to pay for drugs someone had stolen from me, but didn't want to sell my body for money. And I didn't want to steal it either. Someone explained to me how I could get the money for selling my soul. I went there and the woman said, I'll give you the money, but you have to obey my will. She said, you'll give your soul to a demon. I didn't take it very seriously, so I agreed. I didn't know demons really exist. But in the rescue house, I became very aggressive and felt horrible. I felt something heavy in my stomach. They have prayed with me, and now I am set free. Who does your life belong to today? to God and nobody else. And what are your dreams? I want to become a secretary. One of the reasons to give them ballet lessons is to improve their self-image. I am pretty. I am worth looking at. I can do it. It gives them satisfaction and a reason to be proud of themselves. This improves other areas in their lives as well. One girl lost her mother when she was 11 years old. She panicked, went to the streets, and got addicted to drugs. Jocum may literally have saved Bea's life. 
Aí pegou, comecei a namorar. After one year on the streets, I went back home and tried to stop using drugs, but I couldn't. I got engaged with a 20-year-old boy. Then my sister suddenly died. Can you tell me how she died? Two gunshots in her head. She was murdered. And then I was introduced to the House of Rescue, where I followed the two weeks program. And after that, I came to live in the girls' house. Here I learned to know new people and made new friends. And the most important person I learned to know was God. He changed my life and helps me. For instance, when I meet old friends on the street, because of his help, I'm able to resist the drugs they offer me. Were you afraid when you lived on the street? I was always afraid to get killed, to be burned or murdered. I've seen so much of that. I was often afraid at night to fall asleep, so I kept myself awake. I couldn't allow myself to dream. But now I can dream, and it's my dream to become a ballet teacher. Working with girls is more emotional than working with boys. Feelings tend to fluctuate from day to day. Friends from the past tend to drop by frequently. The family, the mother. Sometimes they're the best. In other cases, they're plain garbage. There's no balance. You deal with extremes when you work with girls like these. They have always been on the streets, and what they've lost is something really big. And to come to terms with that is often so difficult. Why me? Why did it happen to me? Why did God let this happen? Why? Why, why? I have gone through it, but the other person is responsible as well. Often, they hurt the other person. Self-acceptance is very difficult for these girls. We work with people who have been deeply hurt, and often to come to terms with these hurts is very difficult. Tatiana comes from a broken family. She never knew her father. Her mother raised her as a boy. When she was eight, her stepfather died, and Tatiana moved in with her grandmother. More and more, however, she roamed on the streets, drinking, dropping in and out of school. She was lost, went to the streets. When she arrived here in this house, she didn't believe she was a girl, or, or she, was, she didn't believe she could be an, a nice girl. She, she hated it to be a girl. When I was in the streets, I dressed like a boy, I always wore my hair short like a boy, loved playing football, behaved like a boy, walked like a boy. Did you have difficulties accepting yourself? Yes, because my mother didn't love me, didn't accept me as I am. She wanted a boy, and she didn't have time for a girl, she said. By behaving like a boy, I was hoping she would love me. I only have brothers, no sisters, so I was accustomed to their ways, and I saw myself as a man. Were you protecting yourself? Yes, because I was afraid of something. People scolded me, called me names, and hurt a lot. Here I learned to forgive all those who have hurt me in the past. Slowly, Tatiana learned to accept herself as a girl. After some time, she even joined the ballet group. I'm a girl, and ballet helps me to walk and feel like one. I never thought I could do it, and even enjoy it, but I do. When I came here, I thought I wasn't worth anything, a destructive thought. I've learned to appreciate myself and discovered that I'm a beautiful woman. I've also discovered that I'm safe with God. To me, he is a good father, the father I never had. I benefit from reading his word and sharing all my thoughts and desires with him. Now I know that I will be able to give love to my own family in the future. It's touching if you see her. She's a little bit afraid still to express herself, but you, you can see her slowly doing it, and, and she dances, and, and she wants to do it, and she wants to learn. Our volunteers help us in trying to work with small groups so we can listen to the girls. Often there's a great need to talk. In small groups, they're able to express their hurts and needs more freely. Each girl also receives psychological counseling by a professional. Plus, they can visit people if they need to talk. They learn to trust little step by little step. 
God again. Learn to trust God as their father. Learn to to live with him and to talk with him and to give their their problems to him and their, their worries. We need dedicated workers who are sincerely interested and willing to invest time in the lives of these girls. We need more staff to be able to accept more girls. Tragically, street mothers with babies cannot be placed in the girls' house. Like Sonia. Yeah, I'm 23. Why are you living on the street? About eight years ago, I left the slums. My two children were born on the street. I used to sniff thinner and steal money or food, but I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to end up in jail and leave my children alone. But you've raised your children on the streets? Yes, on the streets. And is this what you want for your children? No, this is not what I want for them. But I don't have any other possibility. I am looking around and would love to leave the streets. I have been in the house of rescue for a while, but with a young child and a baby, that was too difficult. It caused all kinds of problems, so I had to go back to the street. The leader of the house of refuge, ex-street kid Claudino, is often frustrated that there's not enough space. It's a very difficult situation. Contrary to what many people think, these children here do not have a house and a family. Many of them are orphans. That was my own reality, too. I lived on the streets for 14 years because no one took care of us. No one helped us recover and live a normal life. Do many want to leave the streets? Yes, and I cannot offer them anything because all our houses are full, and then they begin to lose their hope. I would love to have a house and a job so I can give my children what they need. We know those girls for a while already and they, are, they have been begging, please get me off the streets and, and we don't have a house for them. And so we need another house, another home for those girls who have babies and to, to teach them how you take care of a baby, to to teach them a job as well, and, and, and we don't have the staff for it, and we don't have the house for it. We have a baby here, uh, Lucas. He is nine months old now, and he is a baby of a street girl. And besides the fact that he's born on the street and everything like that, he has AIDS as well. You know, you see the second generation of street children. Their children are sometimes born with HIV as well. Some street children die of AIDS. About 12 years ago, Joachim opened a home for them, the House of Refuge. Carla van der Kooi took the initiative. This is Kaiki. Yes. And Kaiki yes. is the president of the House of Refuge. Is it a surprise that he is still alive? It's, it's more than a surprise, it's a miracle. Yeah, absolutely. A half a year ago, the doctor said he only has still three days yes. to live. Yes. And he lost his mother already. His mother was uh, a drug addict. <laughs> and <laughs> his grandmother took care of him. <laughs> you mean een belhamel. His grandmother took care of him, but she never gave him the medicines. <laughs> and it, it is a miracle, you know, that this boy is still alive. She's preparing medicine. How many do the average children need per day? The children will only need a few a day, but there are also children who need... 20, 25 different medicines a day, yeah. Kaiki, for instance, he, at the moment he needs more than 25 different medicines a day for antibiotics and, and uh, antiretroviral medicines. It's quite important to uh, give it at the right time. We, we try to take care of a child uh, in a way a family should do. Above that, all the children need some, some special care because they're HIV positive. Many times they have infections. Uh, regularly they have to go to the doctor. When they are not feeling well, we have to measure the temperature, give them the medicines for that, things like that. So that's why we need 24 hours a day to take care of them. This is uh, Jean Pedro. He, he lost his mother when he was just one week old. And he stayed the first three months of his life in hospital. And since the time he's living with us, he's now three years old. And uh, one day we hope to find a, a family for him. Hamilton is a boy from the slums and has AIDS. He has been very sick uh, three years ago 
En actually was in een terminal phase. De dokter zei, doe je man toe, heeft hem dying in de hospital at home. En wie wanted to have him home. But so many people prayed for him. And as well, he had a desire to live, you know. I think that's also important. He is now almost 13 years old. He's going to school and, and he is enjoying life. If you're looking at a child, hey, you, there's a certain certainty that it will die young. At the same time you send him to school, doesn't that seem to be double? I think it has something to do with ministering life to the children. I speak as well sometimes with the children that we make plans for the future about what profession they want to have or when they will marry. And maybe you think that's crazy, but why not? It's ministering life to the children. Why not making plans for the future? Everything is possible. Eh? Um, life is so extended as well by the antiretroviral drugs. But God can heal the children. But as well, I believe, if, if you think, no, I'm not going to talk about it but because the ch- child will die before they will be 15 years old. You are ministering the spirit of, of death to the children. I don't think that that's right. It's the quality of life, you know. And, and my vision for this house is that it is a, a gate to heaven, a place where we can present the children to, to Jesus. You know, and it's on him to decide if they have a long or a, a short life. Can you hug these children? Oh yeah, absolutely. You don't get AIDS by hugging. Ten hugs a day keeps the doctor away. So. Hugging life. That's what Liz Yen has chosen for. She's good news for all the street children, especially those born on the streets. Lucienne lived with her mother, brothers and sisters on a garbage dump, but she was motivated enough to leave that miserable environment and took her chance. She went back to visit her mother and to her brothers and sisters on the streets, but she always decided, no, I, I, want, I believe the Lord has a, another life for me. For, for all the other girls, she's an example of, of what the Lord can do, how the Lord can turn a life around and, and really bring new hope. It was like a dream come true. A lot of people came, and when I walked in, everyone began to applaud. I felt so very loved. As a child, I always dreamed I would have a normal life with parents who would take me to school every day, and I dreamed I would study and get married. I'm grateful to God for letting me meet the right people. They helped me start a new life. Hopefully I'll be able to give my mother a better life as well. Jilma is the adopted daughter of Johan and Jeanette. When she was two years old, a Jokum team found her in a cardboard box in a slum, filthy, very sick and deaf. Her mother thought she was crazy and had abandoned her Now she's a happy 21-year-old, though slightly retarded from malnutrition. She works in the Jokum Daycare Center for Deaf Children, the house of the sower. In this house, volunteers and full-timers teach them sign language and help them with their homework. The children are stimulated to get to know Jesus and to use the talents they have. In Brazil, like in many third world countries, deaf people are often considered unintelligent Without special help, they are not able to learn and to communicate intelligibly. For all the deaf children, only 10% can go to school. The parents don't even know that schools for deaf children exist, so they won't even try. And it's, if they would try, it's very, very hard to get them into a, such a school. It would be wonderful if uh, ministries like this could be multiplied. Without the Jokum Project for Deaf Children, they would have been treated as mentally retarded. But with some help, they turned out to be bright, communicative young people. They even learned that God knows sign language. They have understood that very well in one of the revival churches in Belo Horizonte. This church offers special services to deaf people. Sermons and songs are being translated into sign language. Dance and drama visualize the biblical message for them. And Jilma? Jilma just loves to go. She loves Jesus, and this is her favorite church. 
Johan and Jeanette not only took Jilma, but also Davy into their family. Davy is 16 now and has spina bifida, which makes him severely handicapped. But he receives good medical care and is able to go to school. Often people think it's so difficult to have a handicapped child and, you know, you're always giving, giving. There's also so much you receive back from a handicapped child. And we've learned so much from, from, from Davi. And, and that is something handicapped children often have. They, they learn to be grateful for the sometimes very few things they have. I can't say that Davi is perfect. He sometimes has his days when he is, you know, <laughs> ungrateful as well. But still, it's something we have learned from his life, you know, a lesson of gratefulness. And that's just really wonderful to see. Do you remember Lucas, the baby with AIDS? Meanwhile, he has been adopted into the healthy, caring family of Thais and Hetty van de Brink. They are the leaders of Luzero, situated in one of the biggest slums of Belo Horizonte. The thought behind this Jocum project is that it is most effective to prevent children from ending up on the streets. Therefore, they concentrate on helping families, often mothers and children, in the slum. One of Belo Horizonte's social workers explains another aspect. One of the major problems for us is to find a place for children who cannot go back home because of the situation in the family. If we concentrate on helping the families, it might be that the child can go back home after, say, three months instead of nine. This means we can begin to help another child six months earlier. I think we can solve the problem by investing in the family. One of the very practical ways Luzero helps families is by supplying food to the very poor. For many families, this is quite a, a common way of uh, living, a small space. Many of the people are sharing the bed with one, two, three other persons. This mother is an active participant of one of the Jokum courses for mothers from the slum. With needlework, they can begin to earn a little money. During the visits that we did in, in the houses of the children, the mothers were always asking, well, don't you have a course for me or an activity for me on your community center or don't you have work for me? They're always needing money and searching for work. And so that's why came, the idea came to start something with women and to have a course for women, uh, have more contact with them, uh, to, to start talking with them about their children, raising their children and, and other subjects that are important for them. And at the same time, offer them something, to have something for them to learn. Many of them didn't go to school or hardly didn't go to school. Some of them even can't read or write. And many times they have a real low self-esteem. And by learning, making such beautiful things, uh, they see that they have talents, that they are able to do something, to make something. And at the same time, it's a way for them to, to have some income because the, the things they make, like the towels and, and kitchen towels, we sell and the, the money that comes in is for them. Deep down in what seems to be the trench of the slum lives a young mother with her children. Her husband was tragically killed, shot dead by a drug gang. Her mother earns barely enough for food. Jokum tries to help this family as well. It's often a hard struggle, especially when you have children, but my faith gives me the strength to carry on. You see that when they get to know Jesus, they start changing. I would like my children to have a good education so they will have a better future. Education is compulsory here from 6 till 15 years as far as I know. And uh, in the slum areas it's uh, quite normal that kids don't study. About 30% of the kids in our slum are not going to school. Education in Brazil is free for the poor people also. Um, the only problem is that the schools in the poor areas, in the slum areas, are very bad. A level of education that's very low compared with the, the private schools. We have kids in, at Luzero, at the lighthouse, 12, 13, 14 years old, that are not able to read, not able to write. 
and they've been studying for five years. Luzero not only helps mothers deal with all kinds of practical problems, but also offers lots of different courses and activities to both mothers and children. Handicrafts are popular, as well as sports. And because it is essential for them to get to know Jesus and learn to live with God, they are invited to join regular Bible studies. Because we believe that the most important change is the change of their hearts. We want to reach out for their whole lives. We want to help them to have a better living. But a better living starts with a, a having another heart and knowing Jesus as your sh Savior because it's the only real peace and real happiness you can find in life. I mean, it's important to give them feed and to help them to develop themselves. But if the, at the same time you don't reach out for their souls, you miss the most important part. But it doesn't mean that they always come out of the slum and that suddenly they don't have problems anymore and they have a lot of money. It's not like that, but it's, it's not even our goal to take out all the people of the slum. We know we want to uh, manage to have everybody out of the slum, but we believe that the slum can be a good place to live and can be a, a good place when God is in the slum. So our goal is not to take people out of the slum, but to bring God into the slum.